Susan Bandy. So it's my great pleasure to have her here. This year, the university presented an ongoing interdisciplinary inquiry into the nature of passion. In the course of the year, we heard from scholars in a wide range of disciplines, from biological anthropology to art history. Today, the law school is pleased to present a companion lecture to the Questioning Passion series. Our speaker today, Susan Bandes, is the Centennial Distinguished Professor of Law at DePaul University College of Law, and she is the perfect choice to deliver this lecture. She edited The Passions of the Law, the leading text on the field, and has published widely on the various ways that emotions can influence, for good and for ill, the decisions of judges and juries. Her work on emotion in capital cases has been particularly influential. Our own Professor Brock, director of our Capital Defense Clinic, has attested to the importance of her work in that area. Professor Bandes is a graduate of SUNY Buffalo and of the University of Michigan Law School. She began her career as a staff attorney at the office of the Illinois State Appellate Defender, and she later served as staff counsel to the ACLU in Chicago. She joined the DePaul faculty in 1984, and since that time she has been a visiting faculty member at numerous law schools, including Berkeley, Northwestern, Miami, New South Wales, and last but not least, University of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Professor Susan Daniels. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, and I, I am just so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I um, wish I could have attended this entire series of events about questioning passion, which just looked absolutely amazing. Uh, and I was pleased to see so many disciplines represented uh, in, these, in this series of talks, including some, like economics, that aren't usually associated with passion. Um, <laughs> And it's fitting, I think, to end this series in the law school because actually law is the most resistant of all disciplines to questioning passion. And I mean that quite literally. It's not just that our discipline, and when I say our, I realize that you're not all both from the law, so um, I want to acknowledge that, but when our discipline um, rejects the role of emotion in the legal system and legal reasoning, it's not just that, it's that it really doesn't want to talk about it. Uh, even raising the question of what role passions ought to play in the legal system is seen as worrisome and destabilizing. So it's very good news that this law school and the legal academy more generally are talking finally about the question of what role emotions play and ought to play in the legal system. What I want to focus on today is the emotion of compassion. And what you might think is, um, who could be critical of compassion? Who could be against compassion? But the question I want to raise is, <clears throat> excuse me, can compassion coexist with the rule of law? <clears throat> to consider this question, we have to confront many of the hard problems with thinking about emotion's role in law. On the one hand, as I said, what could be wrong with compassion? Uh, isn't being opposed to it like opposing kindness or virtue? On the other hand, the idea of injecting compassion into the law raises some concerns about fairness, about consistency, and about equality, among other concerns that it raises. So uh, these issues were very nicely captured in a controversy a couple of months ago that may have uh, flittered across your radar screen at Brandeis Law School at the University of Louisville. The law school decided that it wanted to partner with a citywide campaign called Compassionate Louisville by declaring itself the nation's first compassionate law school. I suspect <laughs> that in the school administration's wildest dreams, the dean and the provost and whoever else signed on to this campaign did not imagine that branding itself a compassionate law school would be controversial. But in fact, it led to a firestorm. 
At least one law professor at the school took, exceptions to the, took exception to the school's effort to associate itself with compassion, arguing very publicly um, in all kinds of media that it threatened the school's nonpartisan, non-ideological stance on legal issues. One of that professor's former students then wrote a passionate response, also widely disseminated, saying, Compassion means sympathy for those who are having a rough time. Compassion means a desire to help the less fortunate. Um, compassionate is, compassion is a way of advocating for social justice. And of course, our law school ought to be in favor of social justice. What is with my professor for arguing that point? Um, the professor disagreed, saying the law should not choose sides in advance of knowing the facts in a particular dispute, and it should not do anything that makes it look like it may be prone to doing so. So I'm going to say that I appreciated this debate enormously. I don't think these are easy questions, and I do think they are precisely the kinds of questions that we ought to be exploring. So I'm going to argue that there are reasons to be wary of compassion in the legal realm. In other places, like one's family or a therapist's office or one's religious institution, compassion might be just a pure, unalloyed good. But in law, we're always making choices about which emotions advance particular legal goals in particular contexts. So broad labels like positive emotion or negative emotion aren't very helpful. So-called positive emotions like empathy or compassion don't always advance legal goals, as I will explain. And so-called negative emotions like anger and fear and outrage don't always interfere with them. It depends on the context. And so I'm actually going to argue, to cut to the chase, that um, we need to distinguish two separate roles of compassion. The usual debate about law and compassion focuses on only one of these roles, compassion as a factor in reaching a substantive decision, a factor in deciding who should prevail in a contested issue of law. And when we think about compassion that way, it actually raises many of the hardest questions about how compassion can be reconciled with the rule of law, as I'll return to in a minute. The second possible role, and the one that I want to argue for, is a way of understanding what is at stake for others. Compassion in that sense involves taking to heart the interests that others have in their legal claims, or to put it another way, seeing the rights of others from the inside as they experience them. Now this meaning of compassion overlaps considerably with the concept of empathy, but it is not the same as empathy, as I will describe. Okay. And I should say right now, and those of you who have gone to any of this Questioning Passion series will know exactly what I mean, that emotion terms are always slippery. None of them have fixed meanings. Compassion, empathy, empathy, sympathy, their meanings have changed over time. Adam Smith in the 18th century wrote about sympathy, but what he was talking about is now called empathy, not sympathy. Different disciplines have different meanings, and even within disciplines, psychology, um, there's an article that I, uh, that I use all the time about 13 different meanings of the word empathy. So we're not going to be agreeing. All we can do, and all I can do right now, is tell you what I mean, how I'm using the terms. And I can't in any way promise you that other people will use them the same way. So let me distinguish now empathy from compassion. Empathy is a capacity for understanding the desires, goals, and intentions of others. It requires a desire to see things from the vantage point of the other, but it's really about perspective taking. It doesn't require any action to aid anybody else's goals. So this is really important for law because using empathy that way, a judge can feel empathy for both or all of the litigants before her. She, and that doesn't mean that any particular litigant is going to win just because she's doing that. It's her job to try to understand what is at stake for all the parties before her. I'm going to give you an example um, from criminal procedure. So this is a case that, um, many, that the, certainly the criminal law professors and maybe some of the students will know. It's called Safford Unified School District versus Redding. This is a 2009 Supreme Court case out of Arizona. Um, question, did it violate the Fourth Amendment for a school principal to have a 13-year-old girl strip-searched 
based on a report that she had drugs on her person. The drug, by the way, ibuprofen. Um, so consider these snippets from the oral argument before the Supreme Court. Okay, first quote, this is Justice Souter. I've got suspicion that some drug is on this kid's person. My thought process is I would rather have the kid embarrassed by a strip search if we can't find anything short of that, then have some other kids dead because the stuff is distributed at lunchtime and things go awry. So what's Justice Souter doing here? I'm saying he is exercising empathy for the school principal and for the school's role and responsibility toward its students. Now Justice Breyer says, I'm trying to work out why this is a major thing to say strip down to your underclothes, which children do when they change for gym. They do this fairly frequently. Um, how bad is this underclothes? Uh, this is the transcript, I'm not making this up. Um, that's what I'm trying to get at. I'm asking because I don't know. Now as happens, oral argument worked the way it's supposed to. Um, Justice Ginsburg helped Justice Breyer see that strip searching a 13 year old in the principal's office is not just like a bunch of teammates suiting up in a locker room. And several amicus briefs also addressed the humiliation and the indignity of a strip search as well. So the justices had this information and they had this really important interchange. Um, and its efforts to understand how such a strip search would feel to a 13 year old helped it do what it had to do under the Fourth Amendment doctrine. What it had to do was weigh the nature of the intrusion on the student against the nature of the school's interest in keeping its students safe. That's the balancing that the Fourth Amendment requires there. Um, now, notably, although the court does ultimately rule the search unconstitutional, it notes, and I'm saying it notes correctly, that the indignity of the search does not in itself make it unconstitutional. In other words, the fact that the court understands and empathizes with the student's trauma doesn't mean the student automatically wins. It needs to, the, the court needs to make its best effort to understand both competing viewpoints and then apply the legal framework, which in this case is weighing the intrusion against the interest of the government. So that is how empathy works, and I'm, I think it worked really well there. Now let's think about compassion. Um, compassion, unlike empathy, commands us to help. Not just to understand, but to help. So compassion for the student in this case would not have been the appropriate tool for decision making. Every litigant deserves to have her viewpoint taken seriously. The fact that a young, vulnerable girl is up against a school administrator can't in itself drive the outcome of the case just because she might be the most sympathetic party. Um, now, what I want to do now is distinguish several ways in which compassion could influence legal decision making. First of all, we might have a statute that explicitly permits the use of compassion as part of allowable discretion. So you might have, let's say, a prison parole scheme that permits compassionate release if somebody's ill or if somebody's relative is ill um, with terminal cancer, let's say. Um, immigration laws might take compassion into account in granting asylum. Um, in these situations, compassion does not pose a particular challenge to the rule of law, in my opinion, because there is advance notice that it will be employed as a factor, and there's guidance for how to use it, and there's a body of precedent. In fact, it's not even clear whether compassion is the right term to describe what we're doing there. Um, because those arguing for these exceptions might try to elicit compassion, but they have to meet prescribed advanced criteria. So federal sentencing guidelines might take into account the fact that a dead defendant has young children, but the standard there is a prescribed standard, the best interest of, interest of the children, not who we feel compassion for. Silent, well-founded fear of persecution on specific grounds. So if the criteria are, advanced, are announced in advance, I don't think there's any kind of a rule of law problem. Um, of course, criteria can always be used inconsistently or misapplied, but that's true all through the law. That's not a particular problem here. Um, second type of use of compassion might be something like the pardon power, which we're hearing quite a bit about right now, or the clemency power. That's a harder 
situation because it's less constrained, because the discretion to grant a pardon um, is so broad. Uh, decisions might be based on compassion, they might be based on raw politics, and often there's no way of even knowing the actual grounds that they are based on. But because the discretion is so broad, there is not going to be any decision that actually exceeds the discretion. Uh, you can't actually score points in your argument by pointing out that a particular pardon decision is inconsistent or unpredictable, because in a sense, they all are. Uh, or to put it a different way, they're all legal because the discretion is so broad. Um, now, here's where we get into some real problems. Uh, compassion used to make unauthorized exceptions to a rule. Federal sentencing guidelines are a great example um, of comparing an allowable range with unauthorized exceptions. So a judge might use compassion to arrive at a sentence that's at the low end. And for the non-lawyers here, um, federal sentencing guidelines um, give a range um, of allowable sentences and then allow for some exceptions and departures from those. Um, so let's say there's a guideline that um, imposed a mandatory minimum sentence. And it shocked the conscience of judges. And this was happening for this you know, has happened quite a bit. So decades in prison for a first-time low-level drug offense, for example. Here's where it gets complicated. Um, the guidelines were meant to stop the practice of letting judges decide based on how they felt in the particular instance or on the particular day, for that matter. They wanted to stop it depending on the luck of the draw as to which judge you got and to regularize things. Um, <laughs> but that cure started feeling worse than the disease, and a handful of judges felt they couldn't abide by them in good conscience. At least one federal judge resigned his position because he <coughs> felt that way, and others just refused to comply in certain <coughs> cases. So Judge Jack Weinstein from the 2nd District from New York, um, well known for his creativity and courage, has defied the guidelines, arguing that judges have a duty not to impose fair, unfair sentences, a duty to expose injustice, and a duty to interpret law with humanity. So let's think about that. Is this the compassion that we want? Now, many believe he's correct in his assessment of the injustice of the guidelines, but what follows from this? If defendants are lucky enough to draw Judge Weinstein, they will receive more compassionate sentences, even though those sentences are probably going to get reversed on appeal, um, than people who don't draw, draw Judge Weinstein. So there's a pretty obvious rule of law problem here, lack of notice and predictability, unequal treatment, arbitrariness. But there's also a bigger problem. If we let a few courageous judges act as a safety valve, we might miss the larger problem, that the guidelines themselves maybe ought to be more compassionate as a whole. Um, perhaps that state of affairs will continue as long as we have a few judges acting as safety valves like that with noncompliance. Um, but that's not a victory for compassion or for the rule of law. A greater victory would be a sentencing scheme that was premised on compassion. For example, one that realized that people make mistakes and that one bad choice shouldn't derail a person's life. Um, or maybe a legal regime that creates effective alternatives to incarceration, giving people the skills they need and resources they need to lead a more productive life. These are all things we could do instead. Um, so here we've got compassion acting as kind of a deviation or stopgap. Um, so for the rest of my remarks, I don't want to talk about any of that. Um, I want to talk about um, whether compassion can help frame the rules and principles themselves. Uh, the United States Supreme Court actually has weighed in on compassion in one of the two cases that got me started on this whole road um, like 20 years ago. DeShaney versus Winnebago County Department of Social Services, 1988. Five four decision, <coughs> Justice Rehnquist came out against compassion as a factor in judicial decision making. The question many of you may be familiar with is whether the state of Wisconsin violated the constitutional rights of Joshua DeShaney, who was age four at the time. Joshua's entire short life had been a nightmarish one in which he was consistently beaten and brutalized by his father. 
This behavior had been repeatedly reported to the Wisconsin Department of Social Services, which was supposed to be protecting him. And the state, um, conceitedly, I guess, um, conceitedly, um, failed to offer that protection right up until the day that Joshua was beaten so brutally, he ended up spending the rest of his life institutionalized with irreparable brain damage. And he died this past November at the age of 36, never having left the institution. Um, so the, the court says, the facts of, and, and I'll backtrack a minute, and so the question here is, okay, the statute's violated, is there a due process violation? Does the federal constitution have anything to say about what happened here, about the state's failure to protect Joshua? And the court says, the facts here are undeniably tragic, and it observed that Judges and lawyers, like other humans, are moved by natural sympathy in a case like this to find a way for Joshua and his mother to receive adequate compensation. But before yielding to that impulse, it's well to remember that the harm was inflicted not by the state of Wisconsin, but by Joshua's father. So compassion is portrayed, or sympathy is portrayed, as a human impulse that must be avoided by judges, an interference with rational deliberation. And that is the standard legal story. Um, we see this over and over, that emotion is impulsive, that it has no helpful cognitive contact, that it is an interference with our ability to reason logically. In fact, DeShaney was a famous catalyst. It helped spawn a whole re-examination of the role of compassion in particular and emotion in general. And at the time, um, and somebody was telling me that a lot of the, the uh, questioning passion talks have been about positive emotions, so I promised to say negative things about positive emotions. Um, <laughs> at the time, um, a lot of the scholarship said, let's bring more compassion, more empathy into law. That's got to be a good thing, right? And I said, I'm glad we're having this discussion. But we should not uncritically embrace compassion, sympathy, and empathy as soft and merciful and therefore always a good thing in law. It depends on the context. Um, so it depends on who is seeking our compassion and for what legal purpose. One of the examples I gave uh, was a judge in Texas who was faced with um, sentencing some young men who had um, beaten um, a gay man um, to a pulp. And he said, I just can't bring it to myself, bring myself to give a harsh sentence here because he was just acting like any red-blooded American. He was acting the way I would want my own son to act. That's compassion, right? Do we want that compassion? So um, using the DeShaney case as an example, a judge has to understand the suffering of DeShaney. It also has to understand the Wisconsin Department of Social Services. Um, they did a really good job of understanding the state's perspective here, really good job. Um, the problems of what happens when you take children away from their biological parents or what happens when you leave children with their biological parents, these are some hard, hard um, choices that have to be made. But is the problem here really that they didn't understand the suffering that, that Joshua went through? I don't really think so, because it isn't actually that hard to comprehend the tragedy of a four-year-old who's lived his whole short life terrorized by his father and then gets consigned to a whole lifetime of institutionalization because of violence and neglect. I would think that's actually a pretty easy kind of compassion, because this suffering is serious and undeserved. Um, the harder question is, who should take responsibility for preventing this violence? That's the question. So Justice Blackman writes a famous dissent, and his dissent is famous mainly because it uses an exclamation point. Um, <laughs> it contains a phrase, poor Joshua, exclamation point. So a lot of people were very critical of the opinion, basically because who's used to hearing judges write that way or speak that way. It's just not an emotional register that we're in any way used to. He says, poor Joshua, victim of repeated attacks by an irresponsible, bullying, cowardly and intemperate father and abandoned by the social service agency who placed him in a dangerous predicament and did nothing except 
dutifully recorded the incident in their files. So he's not saying that the court failed to understand Joshua's suffering, but that the court didn't respond to it correctly. He's saying that he's really calling for compassion, right? He's saying they needed not just to understand, but to do something for Joshua. He's calling for compassion. Now, as I just said to you, I think we can feel compassion for all kinds of reasons, that sometimes it's easiest to feel it toward those we identify with and those we understand, and that that's a problem. Consider a prosecutor who has very broad discretion about who to charge or what charges to bring. Compassion might make her a wiser prosecutor, or she might end up giving a break to those she instinctively understands and sympathizes with and identifies with. And this could end up leading to racial bias, class bias, and other kinds of bias, unconscious or otherwise. So we need to be very attentive to this. Compassion, I'm saying to you, cannot resolve competing claims. We have to decide whether it's a compassion that the law wants to condone or encourage. And I don't even think we should always be privileging the tenant over the landlord, the attractive defendant, likable defendant over the remote corporation. Maybe they should lose in the particular case, but not just because of the compassion we feel, right? For the rule of law, we have to articulate reasons that withstand scrutiny. Okay, but now we come to Justice Brennan's dissent in the DeShaney case. Getting back to this question of what actions our feelings about Joshua should lead to, Justice Brennan's argument was not that different from Justice Blackmun's, except it was written, it looked a lot more like a legal argument, it didn't use that kind of punctuation, and it was not about what we should feel for Joshua. It was about the government's obligation. So the majority says the government did nothing wrong here. In fact, it did nothing. It just didn't act at all. It was the dad who was at fault. It was the dad who acted. Private infliction of harm, no governmental obligation. So what Justice Brennan responds is the government did do something here. They promised protection. They undertook protection. They affirmatively placed Joshua in his father's home when his parents divorced. They effectively held themselves out as the sole guarantor of his safety, and so they did deprive him of liberty. One can feel compassion for a plight that one has no hand in creating. That's a feeling that speaks well for the compassionate soul. But when one has helped create the plight, we ought to be feeling something more than compassion. Compassion sounds kind of optional. What we need is an enforceable obligation, a duty. So the difference in tone that I'm suggesting can be illustrated by considering a case we all know, Brown v. Board of Education. Now, as I will say in a few minutes, compassion likely did play an important role in revealing the true nature of the injustice to black children educated in segregated all-black schools. But it sounds kind of strange and offensive to our modern-day sensibilities to say that segregated schools were outlawed out of compassion for black children. We don't say that, do we? We don't rest on compassion as a reason to enforce the guarantees of equal protection and due process. That sounds uncomfortably like charity and condescension and pity. And in fact, we do not bestow equal and integrated schools on them at all as a charitable act. The question is, is there a right that's been violated? Has an unjust caste system been perpetuated under color of law? And should there even be a we and a them at all? Once we begin talking about an obligation to fix an unjust caste system, the term compassion really doesn't sound like it does the right kind of work. It sounds kind of out of place. So the problem with compassion is not only the way it seems to let the giver off the hook for not doing anything. It's not only the way it seems to bathe the giver in a warm glow to reward his act of charity. It's also a problem because it portrays the person who gets the gift as kind of passive. But when you think about how we've achieved racial equality and gender equality to the extent we have so far, gay rights to the extent we have so far, nothing's ever been given out of the kindness of anyone's heart. It's all been hard fought, and there's a lot more fighting to be done. I don't think it's compassion that usually impels the correction of justice. I think it's moral outrage. And so outrage, a negative emotion, 
well, sort of. Um, <laughs> okay, so the last thing I want to talk about then is what I do think compassion does. Um, it does illuminate suffering. Uh, empathy helps judges understand what's at stake for litigants. And although people often use empathy, in my, in my opinion, incorrectly, and this, is hap this has happened in many of the judicial confirmation hearings and is going to happen again, it's already on the record for whatever hearings we may eventually um, get next, um, this, uh, this opposition to empathy. Although empathy is often assumed to flow only from the strong to the weak, um, I've long argued that that's a mistaken assumption, and I've already given you examples of that, right? The empathy for the school principal in Safford, the empathy for the Department of Social Services in DeShaney, that is empathy too. That's an understanding, in many cases, one that flows very naturally and, and very um, unselfconsciously to people that we understand um, kind of reflexively. So a judge could have empathy for a corporate litigant, for a governmental lit litigant. A judge could, as I said, have empathy for all the litigants before him and not have to act on any of them. The problems are selective empathy and empathic inaccuracy. And these are big problems for judges because judges are encouraged to think that they're omniscient, that they have the kind of the view from nowhere. Uh, that's a real occupational hazard for judges the lack of reminders that they have blind spots and prejudices. That's why I love that oral argument I told you about earlier, because when you have a court that's a diverse court, you can have people telling other people, uh, no, that actually suiting up and strip searching really aren't the same thing. So compassion raises similar concerns, especially if it not only involves taking the plight of others to heart, but also a desire to alleviate that plight. It can rest on inaccurate perceptions. Um, just as it might be possible to understand the perspective of another without caring about that person, it might be possible to feel for another person's suffering without really getting what it is that the sufferer actually needs. Um, compassion can involve a misinterpretation of the pain of others. So one essential proponent of true compassion, I think, has got to be humility. The, professor, the philosopher Richard Peters gave a series of wonderful lectures on reason and compassion. And he said compassion, in this sense, is one of the passions that are essential to reason. The reasonable person, he said, possesses the feeling of humility which is necessary to the wholehearted acceptance of the possibility that one may be in error and the respect due to another who may have a point of view worth considering. So. Consider this well-known failure of empathy, which is also a lack of humility. Justice Kennedy in Carhartt versus Gonzalez, the partial birth abortion case, where he considers the emotional effect of abortion on the woman who has chosen the abortion, late-term abortion, and assumes, after admitting that his assumption is unsupported by any evidence, but says, this seems to me a matter of common sense. It seems to me unexceptionable, unexceptional. He says, it's self-evident that a mother who comes to regret her choice to abort must struggle with grief more anguished and sorrow more profound when she learns what she did not know, that she allowed a doctor to pierce the skull and vacuum the fast developing brain of her unborn child, a child assuming the human form. So in fact, there's actually substantial evidence contradicting what Justice Kennedy is saying here about this correlation between regret and abortion. But Justice Kennedy is comfortable, very comfortable relying on his own belief about what women must feel in order to protect them from making a choice that would lead to those feelings. So the compassionate person to avoid this kind of trap has got to be cautious and open and curious about how others feel and what others need from us. And I think that knowledge is tied to an understanding of our own fallibility and our own vulnerability. And here's a story about a very different federal judge than Judge Weinstein, Judge Alex Kaczynski, to illustrate my point. And then Judge Kaczynski, who many of you may know, is a federal, or know of, is a federal justice judge in California. He's also a very courageous, iconoclastic judge, but he's very different from Judge Weinstein. Most notably, he's nobody's idea of a bleeding heart liberal. 
He's a strong supporter of the death penalty and has generally had little compunction about handing down long prison sentences. And here's a story he tells. One time he was asked to sentence a young woman named Catherine Ponce, a woman with no criminal record who very stupidly agreed to arrange a drug deal for a man who turned out to be an undercover drug enforcement agent. At the time, there were no mandatory sentencing guidelines in effect, so the field was wide open. She could be sentenced to probation, life in prison, or anything in between. And here's the story that the judge tells. He says, as he was pondering her sentence, a seemingly unrelated thought crept into his mind. He says, and I'm quoting now, about a week earlier I had been at home absorbed in work when I heard the doorbell ring. When I went to the front door, I found it wide open, and a young couple was standing there holding a toddler, my young son Clayton. I was a little surprised because I thought Clayton was playing in the house. The couple had been driving down my street, and Clayton was sitting in the middle of the road. Apparently, I forgot to close the door, and Clayton made his way outside and into traffic. As Judge Kaczynski pondered Catherine Ponce's sentence, it hit him quite viscerally that she was not the only one in the courtroom who had made a big mistake, that he, a week earlier, had also made a big mistake and put his own son's life in danger. He says, something inside me made a connection between these two events and told me I would not go wrong if I, too, erred on the side of forgiveness. Now, as the judge himself observes, there are some problems with the story. He didn't have to violate any guidelines because there were none in place at the time. That would have been a harder issue. But still, he worried about basing his decision on the happenstance of his personal experience. And the worry itself, I think, is an important part of the story. Because personal experience, identification, compassion, those get evoked for all kinds of reasons, articulated or unarticulated, and they will always influence decision making. So to the extent we can articulate our compassionate impulses, we can also examine them and evaluate them and decide whether they are relevant. So I think in this story, Judge Kaczynski captures one of the most powerful aspects of compassion, the understanding of shared human fallibility, the fact that we all make mistakes. But he was right to be concerned about the fact that it just happened that a week earlier this had happened with his own toddler, that there was something about Catherine Ponce that triggered this identification. That doesn't seem like a very firm foundation for a sentencing jurisprudence. But the other thing about this story is his self-awareness. It plays two roles here. It instructs him to err on the side of giving other people second chances because we all make mistakes. But it also reminds him that he might be making a mistake in this very case and that he needs to be hyper vigilant about what factors affect his sentencing decisions. So this is my argument about the role of compassion in law. It cannot resolve contests between competing viewpoints. It does offer a way of taking the viewpoint of others with understanding and humility. It might even offer a way of understanding the values and tensions that underlie constitutional interpretation. And I'm going to um, close with these few thoughts about that. How do judges reflect on the values and ideals of the Constitution or other texts that require interpretation in light of changing conditions and values? And how do they understand or how do they seek to understand what these values might mean in the practical world they confront? How do they give spacious, indeterminate language like due protection and due process meaning? And how do they resolve these kinds of tensions we've been talking about between things like security and autonomy and liberty and privacy? They don't begin with abstract principles. They begin with moral intuitions that grow from their own experience and take shape in their own social worlds. And generally, those intuitions are pretty unshakable. Most of us aren't very good at re-examining them under our own steam unless somebody else pushes us or argues with us. It usually requires interchange with people with different perspectives, or at least the openness and humility to admit that other people's perspectives are worthy of respect. And so that possibility takes us to a deeper problem with the Duchenne opinion, which is also a deeper point, and my last point about compassion. Because the majority opinion assumes the government is not required to do anything to protect its citizens, 
only to refrain from doing them harm. And therefore, its reasoning turns on this question of who actually created the situation leading to Joshua's injuries, who acted and who didn't act. This is a debate about what we mean by due process of law. If we have only the right to be left alone, if government's only role is to refrain from directly harming us, then any protection that we receive from the government should be portrayed as a gift, as a kind of compassion. But alternatively, maybe, due process creates affirmative duties, duties flowing from the government to the people. Not just the freedom to be left alone, but the freedom to survive and to thrive. The right to be protected from private violence as well as government violence. The deepest constitutional question is what we ought to be able to understand or to expect from government. And that question is part of a larger debate about what kind of country we want to live in. And at that level, I submit to you, the question of compassion can't be avoided. It's part of a larger question. Is freedom only about autonomy and being left alone, or does it bind us together in a web of care, concern, and obligation? And the question for the legal system, what roles should our laws and our courts and our legal institutions help a play in helping us to achieve those goals? Thank you. exposed to something that you wouldn't have otherwise been exposed to, otherwise you're, you're going to have this limited range of a sense of compassion. Does that cause you concern about our Supreme Court, which tends to draw people who have such common experiences, they you know, potentially are, have gone to the same schools all together, they have the same rings? Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a great point, and it causes me tremendous concern about that. You know, in some of my areas, like the Fourth Amendment area, um, there have been times when it's been very clear that, um, let's see, I think it was Justice Roberts at one point, for example, who made it clear that, that he had never been pulled over for any kind of a traffic infraction and had no idea what happens when you are. And I think it was Justice Sotomayor who was the only one who seemed to have any experience or knew anyone who had any experience in that realm. That's just one example. But, um, you know, so yes, I think it's absolutely crucial. We've got to, you know, we, we want to avoid an echo chamber. I mean, that's exactly what we want to avoid. Um, what's the point of having nine people if um, they all went to the same two schools? <laughs> <laughs> yes? You said that you are in favor of outrage. Um, so it seems like outrage is just the other side of the line of compassion. And, and is that something that you know, should be motivating judges in sentencing decisions? Oh, no. no. So I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about moral outrage. Um, I guess the, the bottom line for anything I say is that none of these emotions are themselves normative. You know, you, you always have to ask moral outrage about what. Um, you know, in a democratic system, we're not all going to share the same moral outrage. In a legal system, um, moral outrage might <laughs> impel us in good directions or bad directions. For example, uh, I've written about moral panics. You know, a moral panic is a term that I think we give retrospectively when we look back and say, why did we go crazy about what we thought of as satanic sexual abuse in, in daycare in, in the early 1980s? Um, that was the wrong kind of moral outrage, right? But moral outrage um, has also, for example, um, there was a wonderful article um, by a, a woman named Deborah Gould about, about the effect of Bowers versus Hardwick and how it, it mobilized people and led to laws. Now, you know, it depends on what you think the law should be, but ultimately it's all about whether we can articulate reasons for outrage and whether those reasons turn out to be the right reasons. And we're going to disagree about that ultimately as well. Yes, sir? Well, just to follow on with this point, would then better preparation for the judiciary or even the legal 
profession as a whole to have spent time uh, in homeless shelters uh, working with infants in, in daycare programs, social service programs, uh, uh, to broaden that experience that uh, you have before you get to the point of having a you are you you are arguing in favor of that? I was asking you whether I'm arguing, arguing in favor. Of that. Yeah. No. I, this is something that you know. First of all, we can't. It, it's not practical to expect judges themselves to experience everything. And there's actually a whole fascinating thing that happened with Judge Kaczynski, where he decided he was going to go visit a prison, and then ended up actually getting accused of being partisan after talking to people at the prison. <laughs> Um, but, you know, <laughs> the bottom line is, um, no, it's not practical to expect um, judges to have every experience. And, and there are other things we can do. Amicus briefs, for example, are a really good way of helping educate judges about things they don't know. Um, but uh, I do think that... Um, and, you know, the, the issue of, of uh, Supreme Court justices hiring a counter clerk, a clerk who doesn't agree with, with their um, ideology. I mean, there, there are lots of ways that we can try to expose ourselves to different perspectives. I, for me, the bottom line is not thinking that you're omniscient, is understanding that there are things you don't know um, that, you, that you may need to find out. That's, that's the real issue. Yes, you mentioned the sympathetic plan, which we hear a lot about in school. But um, after I ever read my law review note this, this past semester, and it seems to me I've read a lot of cases where there'd be a paragraph of, we understand the tragedy, how unfortunate, you know, kind of short shrift. And then do judges see the sympathetic plaintiff and overcorrect in their, in their rationale or their reasoning? Where because there's, so, because there's room for compassion that you think they that's a good question. I mean, I, I just don't know the I just don't know the answer to that. I mean, it, it may it may happen, but I guess the points that that I want to emphasize are are twofold. One, that um, we shouldn't think of sympathy as something that only flows toward you know the uh, the child or the abused person or uh, you know the the homeless. Um, I, I think that's that's a mistake. I think that judges often feel sympathy for corporate defendants, governmental defendants, powerful defendants. It just doesn't get categorized that way. And that really leads to my other point. Um, this kind of sympathy, this kind of identification, uh, you can't really get away from it. All you can do is try to be aware of it. You know, getting back to um, the question of trying to be aware of it or trying to have other people to help correct your tunnel vision. Um, it's not always something that's going to show up in an opinion. That judge I talked about earlier, the one who was very happy to say on the record that um, he wanted, he would be happy if his own son, you know, beat a gay guy to a pulp. I mean, most judges are not, you know, are smarter than um, saying that on the record. But this kind of identification is, 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 I think, part of the fabric of law. There's really no way around it because how do we learn about the world around us from other people? Um, the story about you know, the story about um, Justice Powell in, in Bowers versus Hardwick. Some of you may know the story. He um, thought that he had never met a gay person. It turns out actually that one of his clerks was was gay, but hadn't come out and didn't come out to him. And he was really trying to understand. He he actually knew that he didn't fully understand um, the idea of sexual intimacy between people of the same sex. And he was trying to ask his clerk to explain it to him. But he, he never, he didn't really get it. And so that, the opinion reflects that because he ends up portraying um, the, the, the sexual act there not as intimacy but as sodomy, basically. And later on he described that as a decision that he, he was unhappy with, that he regretted. But, you know, the key there to me is he, he knew he... He didn't quite understand. He was he was trying. Um, that's really all we can ask. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I have a question about. So you're in favor of moral outrage uh, compared to uh, compassion? No, it depends on the circumstances for both. Okay. So I was just curious about um, is moral outrage in any way immune to any of the problems you talked 
about was compassion. Absolutely. Um, some moral outrage, you can be outraged about something that ends up being a good thing or a bad thing. You know, the fact that you have moral outrage doesn't mean it's, it's a normatively correct position for the law, right? You still have to have the argument, you still have to have the discussion. But if there were, if there were no moral outrage, um, I think we would have a problem. I think that many of, you know, think about how the law has changed. You know, how we got to Brown versus Board. I mean, you know, the, how we got to Lawrence, um, how, how we got to these changes in the law, not just applying the law that is, but thinking there's something really wrong here. I'm going to argue that that's moral outrage. But moral outrage can take you in, the, you know, in, a, in a different direction, too. Um, but without it, a lot of these things are not going to get kick-started in the first place. Can I just add to that uh, follow-up question? So am I understanding correctly that uh, the role of empathy or compassion and, uh, and moral outrage, their role are mostly a, well, epistemological, like trying to help you to identify the problem. And then after that, emotions are not very useful. You get other things, moves, and Well, no, I was just talking about compassion here, OK? So for compassion, I made a distinction. I said that I think I agree with you that you know the epistemological role of it is very important. It helps you really understand, and empathy does as well, right? I argued um, that you can't resolve a case based on compassion; that it, it only helps you understand what's at stake. But that was only about compassion. So I, I would never say that, at, that that emotion stops mattering after that. You know, my, my, my belief is that emotion is everywhere in law. It's just not always identifiable, it's not always articulated, but it's, it's, it's everywhere. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, so, you're kind of a Judge Kaczynski, Kaczynski other thing, but opinion you wrote a few years ago. This is the one about the um, GPS tracking yes. device on the other side of the car. Yes. And it's a dissent he wrote from the I guess, petition for rehearing of that. Yeah. And, and he makes the point, I think the police had put it on on the street, the guy was parked on the street outside of his apartment building, and he says, um, you know, the Fourth Amendment protects people in different ways, and we've got a very diverse, relatively diverse federal judiciary now, but there's one thing that every federal judge has in common. They're rich. Um, and so, in that context, I mean, if you accept the premise that there's a structural inequality in, in the way justice is administered, couldn't there be a defensible position that uh, almost like a structural compassion in favor of the poor in the system, mm. which is not susceptible to um, some of the critiques you, you put there. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, I, I think you're raising a really hard question. I, I actually wrote a paper about Judge Weinstein, you know, who um, I think would completely agree with you. And in, in terms of the federal courts, um, at least, I, I think that you know what he would argue, and I would probably agree with him, um, as is that the court is meant to be a counter-majoritarian institution, and and is is you know really does should be skewed or does have a special duty to protect those that aren't protected by um, the executive and the legislature. So you know, but the point I think that I would make is that that's a choice, you know, that we can debate about the role of the federal courts. Um, and, you know, I'm on the same page as you, but I, I, I recognize that other people don't see the federal courts that way, and I think those people should have to deal with, you know, issues of, of skewed empathy also. But um, for those who you know who aren't in, um, who don't know about it, it's really it's really a great opinion. Um, it, I'll, I'll just uh, talk a little bit more about it for those who aren't lawyers. Um, so the um, police put a GPS tracking device on somebody's car, and the car was parked in the street, um, and most of the court saw no privacy problem or you know didn't think there was any any problem with their doing that because the car was out on the street and he says um, the thing is we judges we all have BMWs and we can all drive them into our covered garages <laughs> so it, it, you know we don't have that empathy we don't, we don't get it that not everybody has those privileges that we do so it's really a great example yes Hi, thanks very much for your talk and I think uh, I agree with you that both compassion and moral outrage in themselves uh, don't solve 
for the hitting thing. I mean, they, they, they raise questions, and you sit for each of them, and you need to look behind it and, and ask for more of that raise about what, compassion for mm -hmm. what. Mm -hmm. But once you do that, you still can be left with intractable problems. And I, you know, raise the abortion controversy as one example. Right. Both sides feel compassion and moral outrage. Right. You know, moral outrage directed against the other side, compassion for the side that they favor. Right. And so there they are. Right. And it's intractable. Right. So, so what happens there? Is it just that both sides need to try to, you know, to understand the, the other side more? I mean, there would be empathy of trying to understand where the other side is coming from. Right. But you would, you would still feel the same moral outrage against their position and compassion for your side. Well, you have to put forth reasons that other people can sign on to. You have to articulate those reasons, right? And then you end up with disagreements. But we already know, we already know about those. And abortion is a really good example. Um, there was a, a wonderful article by a woman who I think teaches at, at St. John's, where she said that, you know, that there's a problem that we, we don't feel compassion for the fetus, right? Um, and how do you resolve that? The term, you know, this is a great example of how compassion itself doesn't resolve this problem. Ultimately, we have to make a legal decision, a normative legal decision about whether or not that compassion is one that law recognizes, you know? Um, and so recognizing that the emotions are at work, you know, I think you and I are probably agreeing here, isn't going to resolve the problem. And I'm not arguing that it does. Um, but I, I am arguing that that doesn't mean that the emotions um, are to be ignored. You know, the, the, the usual legal stance is they, they, they can't give us any information and they're interfering with reason. And I'm saying, well, you know, ultimately they're not interfering with it, but ultimately you have to be able to articulate and argue the reasons. You know, and then the fact that we're still going to be left with some very deep ideological divisions is no news to us, right? But that's not because of emotion. That's because that's what law is. So I think it's pretty easy to feel compassion, although we wouldn't always call it that, for um, groups or large entities like nations. Um, and that's what I say, we don't always call it that, but we do feel it. But one thing that it's pretty clear that we have a hard time feeling either compassion or empathy for is future generations, especially to find out on the threshold of those that we're not going to know. And so I take as my example um, global climate change, mm -hmm. where there's a tremendous amount of reason that's been devoted to demonstrating catastrophic future change that will affect future generations that hopefully we won't know. Um, <laughs> although, <laughs> if things speed up, we might. Um, and I wonder whether in cases like that where the, the reasoned argument seems to be um, just too difficult to persuade us to activate our compassion for large groups in the future, um, especially when there would be costly trade-offs for those of us living in the now, whether that would be a circumstance where it would be legitimate to attempt to activate something like compassion or empathy for those others that we won't know. Um, because reason apparently is failing. Yeah, I, I, I think you, you can tell me if I'm, if I'm misconstruing, but I, I think what you're, what you're arguing is we can always deploy empathy, compassion, storytelling, I mean, you know, your work, um, to help people understand what's at stake. And I, I think you're arguing that this might be a really good place to do that. Well, if, if you have a case where evidently reasoned discourse has failed or is in the process of failing. So what so I would... Is that a place where you would say, all right, given that we know that compassion or empathy is susceptible to all sorts of um, things that we wouldn't want, like unjust distribution of resources is a typical mm -hmm. example, but that there are some cases where you can just look at the situation and say, well, reason is failing here, so we might have recourse to uh, a call to the emotions in a way that would be legitimate. So what I would say is that's not an opposition that I would sign on to. I mean, I don't think that, you know, that we ever reason without 
some of those without those emotions, without thinking about stories, without thinking about people, without giving con concrete um, examples. Well, uh, I agree with you, of course. I, I know, I know that, that you do. So, so in the climate change area, um, I mean, you're certainly right. You know, thinking about future generations is really hard for us. And even you know, thinking about your original idea about nations. You know, I mean, right now, as as often before, there's a debate about whether we're feel, you know, why people might feel more empathy for victims in Brussels than in the Ivory Coast. I mean, you know, these these are endemic problems. So, you know, the argument, you know, as you all know, is that you know, narrative can take us off course, and you know, that we we start feeling empathy for people that are easier for us to identify with, and. All I'm saying is, you know, the narratives are, are everywhere. I mean, it, it, it's just, um, you know, which ones ultimately uh, end up with reasons that can be articulated, you know, that, that, that the law is willing to sign on to. You know, I mean, we, is anybody watching the, uh, this O.J. Simpson? Um, I mean, you know, they're saying something there that we know to be true, and maybe at the time we didn't know it as well. Um, no jury ever walks away from a trial saying, boy, that was a really logical argument. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they say, what a compelling story. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but, you know, the law, is, that's the way the law is, 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 is structured. You can't, you, you know, the, the facts, the dry statistics are never going to win the day, in my opinion. Let's again thank Professor Bain.